good evening, everyone. I am Lori Rocher from Oxford Township Parks and Rec. Uh, we may have a few stragglers coming in here. I think we'll mix up on time. I do apologize for that. Um, I would like to ask if you could please silence your phone and please help yourself to coffee, water, or a snack. I would like to introduce our speaker tonight is Professor Emeritus John R. Todd, and his topic is the American flag. And John has spoken here several times. He will save time for questions at the end. Is that correct? Save time for questions at the end. And he has also brought some interesting show and tells. So if you could please welcome Professor. Thank you. Thank you, Lori, uh, for that kind introduction. And welcome to everybody who's here. Okay. Right, should I go ahead? Go right ahead. I apologize. Yep. Okay. Um, and because of the some confusion with the time, I added a little uh, something in the beginning that I hope you'll enjoy. And as Lori said, I brought a show and tell. So I'm going to pass this around. And. Uh, and then I will tell you the whole story behind it. And make a note of who's standing and who is sitting. Can everyone hear in the back okay? Can you hear okay? Can everybody take a look at the boats? I was much younger and uh, stockier. <laughs> And here is the story. Oh, about 30 or 40 years ago, I was working in Washington. By the way, I'm a lawyer. Don't call that against me. And I am a veteran of the Vietnam War. I was gunship pilot. I was shot down. And I worked for one president. And later, I worked for another president. But in the middle, I worked in Congress. And in the 70s, the major veterans groups came to me, and they wanted to hire me. And they wanted me to pass a bill through Congress. Oh, that's easy enough. And then they told me which bill they wanted. And I said to them, wait a minute. You mean a bill to benefit widows and orphans of disabled veterans? We don't have it? Because after World War II, Congress was very generous to veterans. The GI Bill, GI Home Loans, and a lot of other stuff. So I was surprised. And this was also at the time when President Carter first came into office and gave an amnesty and a pardon to draft dodgers and deserters. And <clears throat> I'd been drafted. I went to Vietnam. I didn't desert. So I didn't think this was a good idea. And I worked for a senator. I did research on the Constitution and the laws. And he introduced a Senate resolution against the amnesty for Dodger Senators. And I wrote and did the research. And then, the House of Representatives had a special committee in, in looking into that. They called upon me to share my research and I testified. And so that is when the veterans groups thought that I'd be a good advocate for them as a lobbyist. And by the way, not only questions at the end, but anytime uh, you can ask a question if I want to make the story make sense. So is everybody following along? 
Okay. Well, I met with the Senate committee leaders, and they said, well, John, we have good news and bad news. The Senate already passed that bill about four years ago. But the House won't even touch it. They won't even talk about it. They won't introduce it. And now on that point, by the way, I taught political science for 42 years, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about how Congress passes along. Any member of Congress or the Senate who has an idea about a law can introduce it. And now I want class participation. How many new proposed laws are introduced in every two-year Congress, a Congress last two years? So just guess. How many are introduced? 42. OK, anyone else? 200 a year. OK, anybody else? How about? 10,000 a year. And 20,000 are introduced in the House, and then most of them are copies, and another 20,000 is introduced in the Senate. Remember, both houses must pass the bill. And so from 1945 to 1977, 30 years, the House would never even introduce this bill. Well, that sounded like a challenge to me. So I agreed to do it. And since I had worked for Senator Allen, I did a good job for him. I just, and since the Senate had passed the bill, I decided to go to a friendly guy, went to his office, said to the receptionist whom I knew, I need five minutes with the man. She looked at me and said, you'll be lucky to get two. But she picked up her phone. I went in. I said, sir, I've got a new job. I'm a lobbyist. He said, oh. I said, for all the veterans groups. Oh, right. Congressmen, senators, they love veterans groups because they love their vote. So then I said, and I want you to introduce a bill for me. Every senator can do that, every House member. What do you want? So I told him what I wanted. He said, a bill for widows and orphans of disabled veterans. And by the way, he was <clears throat> quite a Christian. He said, Jesus said, take care of the widows and orphans. So I, I'm using that line, and I, and he said, "What does Chairman Cranston think of it?" And that was a key question. Now here's lesson number two on how the Congress works, and we'll have another educated guesses from the audience. Right? Everybody ready? Everybody got your brains turned on? Sure. What percentage of bills that become law are first decided by a small subcommittee, seven or nine members, and never even debated by the full House or Senate? Guess what percentage? Just a small committee says yes, and a few months later, it's passed. Who said that? Okay. It's actually 90%. Because the House and the Senate, they each have 20,000 bills to look at. How in the world do they examine all of those and then come? And by the way, here's another one. 
How many brand new laws are passed in any two-year Congress? I mean brand new. How many? One. Ten. It doesn't close. Maybe three. Now, you're familiar with, first of all, does the Department of Defense every year get some money? Everybody? Yes. That's a, that's a bill. Does the FBI get their money? Yes. No. Uh, school lunches and all kinds of stuff get their money? Yes. Well, those bills always pass. But brand new ones are very rare. And here is how the Congress really works. And I will give you, if, does anyone remember back in the same period of time, early 70, well, 75, 77. And by the way, I'm going to be <clears throat> politically neutral here. We don't have any big uh, political debates. President Carter wanted to draft, register for the draft, women. Anyone remember that? Anybody? Yeah. All right. And he called two congressmen in the House. One was a Democrat, one was a Republican. And said, I want you, I'm the president, I want you to introduce a bill for me because the president cannot do that himself. He has to get a congressman or senator to introduce the bill. Now, we'll have some guesses. Think of one congressman, Democrat, and one Republican. Would they want to do a favor for the president, everybody? True, everybody. Say yes. 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 So they did. Turned out that one of them didn't even favor it. Wow, it's a favor with the president. Here's what happens. They type it up on a little form. They go to the front of the house, put it in the big hopper. Later at the end of the week, remember there are 20,000 bills introduced, so they check every week. The staff reads it. It says, proposed bill requiring women to register for the draft. The smart staff members in Congress say, well, that sounds like the Armed Services Committee in the House and Senate, there are about 25 large committees, 40 people in the House, a dozen, 13 in the Senate. They sent the bill to the full Armed Services Committee. The smart people on the staff, who I used to be on the staff, so I always like to say that. <laughs> they read the bill, proposed a lot, for women to register for the draft. Say, that sounds like our subcommittee on manpower. Does. So they send it down to the subcommittee. Seven members. Now take notes again. Every committee in Congress and every subcommittee has a chairman. <clears throat> And a majority of the committee, they stack the deck, who's a member of the majority part party. So in 1977, the Congress had, oh, 10, 10 15 percent more Democrats than Republicans. So every chairman was a Democrat. And on every committee, they, they set up the numbers and stack the deck so that there was a majority of Democrats. The way that goes way back to Thomas Jefferson in the Senate. And he thought it was a good idea. I usually agree with him. And so this small subcommittee, seven members, four Democrats, three Republicans. Since the president wanted it, and the Democratic Party wanted it, they told that chairman hold a hearing on the bill. And you've seen those on TV. By the way, uh, when I was in law school my freshman year, 
you know, everybody dressed casually. Casually, I went to a law school with my wife. Uh, it was a natural blonde, so we were like Bill and Hillary, but she was a natural blonde. And <clears throat> one day I showed up in a three-piece suit and wingtips. My classmates came to our morning. What's going on? Why are you all dressed up? I just casually said that. Oh, I'm testifying in Congress today in the afternoon. Well, when I got up to testify, all my law school buddies were in the gallery, Bronx cheering and laughing and everything. But when I finished, they liked me. So a hearing is very important. And here's what happened at the draft women hearing. The president and the Democrats called the generals. And they said, it's a dangerous world. And we might have to build up the army again. And that takes draftees. We might need a lot, so we might have to draft women. That's what the generals said, because their commander in chief told them to. By the way, I was a military officer. I did what my superiors told me most of the time. That was kind of, kind of a joke. Now, and the Republicans, they called in mainly Christian groups who said God created man and woman and women bear children and women are mothers and they should not be drafted. Well, after the hearing, the committee voted. And the vote was four to three, three Democrats, one Republican, for four, two Republicans, one Democrat, for three. And they had come to a compromise. They took the president's bill that said male and female and crossed out female. <laughs> Then, the subcommittee sent the bill back up to the full committee of 43 members. Here's what they said. Our trusted subcommittee held a hearing, and our trusted subcommittee decided not to draft and register women. We all agree, just rubber stamp. Then the full committee sent it to the full house. And at 55 or 6 percent, a bunch of Republicans too said, our trusted armed services committee and their subcommittee, they think this is a good idea. We all vote for it. That's how bills get passed. Any comments or questions? Does this surprise anybody? Any comments or questions? Tell me your name and speak loudly. No. No questions. I well, have a question for who's this? Laura? Yeah. So how long does that process take? Oh, great question. It took me a year and a half. Oh my goodness. Now, well, now the draft women, that only took about two months. Okay. Now when I get to my bill. It took a year and a half because they didn't like it. I had to work at it. Now, <clears throat> before we go more deeply, does anyone want to hear the true story about the Obama picture? Yes. yes. Good. Because I passed this bill, which you'll hear about later, by the way, we'll get to flag day two and let more people come. Yeah. I'm blind. And I'm Getting older, so I'm sitting on a stool. When I first got the watch, there was a lady in it. Then I set the time. It's a guy. I've got a transgendered watch. So, because I passed the bill that everyone thought was impossible, I was getting a national award. And I got on the stage with a coat and tie on at 8.30 in the morning, hot lights, and all the speakers were headed out. 
They sat me directly behind the podium so that when it was my part, I wouldn't fall off the stage. Very considerate. So I was directly behind the podium. The president got there, I think, at 11. Mrs. Obama was there, too, and she spoke for half an hour. So the president was speaking at noon. He's facing the audience. His back is to me. He had a soft voice. All the speakers were going out. I have a hearing problem. The president went on for another half hour. When he turned around, everybody standing ovation. You can see the other people. What's Todd doing? He's <laughs> sitting down. My wife was in the audience. She knows who I vote for. She just rolled her eyes. What's he doing now? <laughs> I fell asleep. <laughs> now, here's, he turned around. He sees everybody standing up, and he sees me sitting down. Obviously, white shirt, tie, conservative. I look like a Republican. Came up like he's shaking hands with me. He bangs me in the chest. He was mad at me. So I woke up. I said, uh, good morning. And then other people took him away. And I'm not sure he realized I was asleep. But that's the story. So somebody please bring back that picture. I love that picture. I have a question. What? I have a question. Who's that? Paul Lucas. OK. Go in, ahead. In the uh, dealing with the president, when the president wanted the women to be part of the draft. What did he do when they didn't do that? He signed the bill. Oh, so they didn't. He just said. He didn't want it then. No, no, he wanted it. There's nothing he could do. He couldn't veto it because then men wouldn't register for the draft. Okay. No, he just said, ah, we'll get it later. Good question. Does that answer? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> now we'll get to my bill, or Laura will have more people come. It's about. Okay, we need. Yeah. I'll finish this story, and then we'll get to flag it. As you recall, when the idea of amnesty for draft dodgers and deserters, when the House had a meeting, they invited me to research and give a speech for them. And I even made tele-TV that night in Washington. Uh, I knew I was going to be on TV. I had a two-year-old daughter. We're in our den watching TV. Sure enough, they have a picture of me testifying in Congress. I say to them, my wife says to the two-year-old, Lacey, who's that? She's playing with something. She goes, Daddy goes back to playing. She was not impressed at all. My daughter wasn't impressed. But you need to be. That was a joke. <laughs> now, I found out, I then went up to the House subcommittee and committee. By the way, the committees, they're the, the brains of the Congress and the Senate. They do all the research. They write all the speeches. I wrote some speeches for a senator. I wrote a paragraph for President Nixon, because he has a committee. But um, I asked the staff, the House staff, and I had a friend whom I went to law school with, Jim Webb. You know, he ran for president, secretary of the Navy, uh, Wes Newbot. Naval Academy grad, a former Marine hero. And I said, Tim, what's the story here? Why won't they touch it? He brought in a gentleman who had worked for the committee since after World War II. He'd worked there 30 years. He knew everything about veterans' benefits. He even had a nickname. His name was Smokey. I said, Smokey, what's the problem? Widows and orphans. He said, there is a problem with service connection. Here's what that means. Do we have any veterans here? 
anybody. Generally, veterans' benefits are given to those men and women who, as a result of their service, have a handicap or disability. And they call it service connection. And I think it's rational. And therefore, the widows and orphans of a disabled veteran, they weren't injured in the war. There's no connection. And I said, yeah, I got to beat that one. <laughs> in that, in order for my bill to pass, I had to go against this long-standing doctrine of Congress. So I started to work. <clears throat> and now, another question for you brilliant government people. How many members in the House of Representatives? Four thirty-five. How many members of the U.S. Senate? 50 times 2. 100. Now remember, I'm a lobbyist. One of those evil lobbyists. Let's all boo. <laughs> well, I was a good lobbyist. Okay. Now, here's a, another uh, question for you guys. As a lobbyist, How many House members did I contact and speak with to, in order to persuade them to pass my bill? Any guesses? Out of 435. 40. Any other guesses? Nine. Any other guesses? Three. Nine from the committee. All of them. Two. Two. Wow. Remember the subcommittee. Remember a subcommittee as a chairman from the majority, in this case, Democrat party, and they have on the minority side, the, they have what's called the ranking member. He's the senior minority member. <clears throat> I called Jim Webb back at the, at the staff, and I said, who's the chairman of the subcommittee relevant to my bill? He checked. He had to look it up. So, Sonny Montgomery of Mississippi. He's the guy that I did a favor for. I said, wow, this is great. Now, so, that afternoon, afternoon, I called his office. I said, I'm John Todd. I'm a lobbyist for the veterans group. I need to see the chairman, by the way. Chairman, you always call him chairman, like general. And I was on a first name basis with Mr. Montgomery. I called him chairman, he called me John. A little bit of a joke. <laughs> um, so, anyway, she said, How about tomorrow afternoon at three? Yes, ma'am. Now, I want all of you, the next time you go to Washington, See the sites, go to the congressional office buildings, call your congressman and say, I'm a voter from Oxford Charter Township. My wife and I, we always vote. I'd like to see the congresswoman. She's our, the, the lady, the, uh, the person on the phone will say, wonderful, come on in and we will arrange a meeting with the staff member. You will never get in to see the Congress. As a lobbyist, why is that? Anybody? Influence. You got the deep pockets. What? You got the deep pockets. That's right. Who said that? Paul oh, Bunker. <laughs> yeah. Not only campaign funds, but veterans. Do we have any veterans here? No. Well, so all the veterans groups, American Legion, VFW, DAV, all the veterans groups, the big thing they have is a monthly magazine. And every month, 
there is a whole section of bills that they want. And every month there's pictures of their leaders in Washington meeting with senators and congressmen. And they're saying that they're not, see how important we are? We're the ones in Congress getting you what you need. And so therefore, members of Congress and chairmen love veterans groups. They're key to votes. So I went in, Chairman Montgomery was, said, John, good to see you because, you know, two months ago I had done a good job for him. He'd gotten a majority of votes, just like my senator got a majority votes on what I'd argued. So they kind of appreciate it. And I said, I've got a new job. I'm a lobbyist for veterans groups. He said, oh, great. Let's talk. And he said, That's, by the way, this is all in minutes. Here's the big question, he said. What do they want? I said, DIC. That was the official name. He frowned. I could feel the frown. He said, John, we can't give you that. I said, sir, I've met with all the veterans groups this term. They want cost of living, but this is the only thing they want. He said, they will be disappointed. So I guess Smokey was right. They had a big legal problem with DIC for widows and orphans. I just knew there were some widows and orphans who might be in trouble. So I went to work. As I left Mr. Montgomery's office, I dropped by the receptionist and said, do you have a list of all the uh, zip codes in southern Mississippi? She, oh, of course. I said, can I have a talk? Sure, yes, sir. I went down to one of the big veterans groups. And the big veterans groups, they're very proud of all their members. We've got millions of them. We, we've got millions of posts and legions and stuff, and we can get a lot of pressure. That's what they told me. I just listened. So I went down to the big building, went down, I said, I need to talk to the computer mailing list guy. He was down in the basement. I had the 10 zip codes for Southern Mississippi. I said, can you send to these, there were about a dozen zip codes. He said, sure. So, so I typed up a letter. By then, the big boss, who was my dad's age, World War II vet. <clears throat> By the way, I was 30. I'd flown in combat. I had a DFC. I had a Cross of Gallantry. I had a Bronze Star. I didn't think of myself as a young whippersnapper, but that's what he called me. And he said, oh, I'm glad you're down here getting some mailings. We can send it to 50 states. We can send it to 800,000 homes. The, the computer tech said, uh, Sir, Mr. Todd just wants 10 zip codes. And I said, in South Mississippi. And he just looked at me, shook his head, and went out of the room. He knew it was all, he thought all was lost. Well, I sent a thousand letters. My letter said, Dear veteran and spouse, I'm your lobbyist working in Washington to give you new benefits of DIC. And I explained what they were. If the veteran dies and his widow and orphan are in economic trouble, there will be new benefits for you. And I've got your congressman with whom I'm talking, the very well-respected Sonny Montgomery. By the way, I sent him a copy. Your black man. Montgomery. He's, I think he died in 
This is, this was 30, 40 years when I was young and more handsome. Um, out of the thousand letters that they sent, a hundred people wrote, and I said, handwrite it, don't type it, handwrite it, sign your name, sign your your name and your wife's name. Put, put your possible orphan kid's signature on it, too. Yeah, I, I, I go all the way. Mr. Mon Chairman Montgomery called the office, left a message that I should call him back. I called him back. He said, you've been busy. Yes, sir. That's my job. He said, I will introduce that bill for you. <laughs> then he said this, but it's called, I make a note on the bill that says, by request, which means that I'm against it, and the leadership is against it, and we will never have a hearing on it. Well, I went back to legal research and researched for about another year. Oh, a year later, it was July. Here's something that the full committee does. They call it a courtesy hearing. By the way, is this boring? Should we go into flags? Yes. Or should go into flags? Should I continue with the story? Yes. Good. I shouldn't have made it complex. All right. Excuse me, Professor. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll finish the story, and then let's go ahead and start our flag day oh. program. We're about quarter after seven. I don't think our other guests are going to show up. Nope. Believe me, we will do flag. Yeah. Awesome. No, no. Thank you. Thank you. I'll be quick. The full committee had what they called a courtesy hearing for veterans groups. All the veterans groups leaders come. 43 members, the full committee of the Veterans Committee, and they say, you guys are great, veterans love you, thanks a lot. And then they get pictures with the congressmen to put in the magazines to show how powerful they are. The full committee had a rule. That's what the leaders are supposed to say. There's a rule, you can't bring up real legislation. Well, I convinced them. I said, look, you hired me to pass this bill. Let me speak. You can be in the background. You can get pictures. I'll, I'll give a speech. So I, I said, the Veterans Committee is the greatest in the world. You all are super. We all super. We all love you. Thanks a lot. Now let me tell you about my bill. And of course, my boss shuddered. But I told them about the bill, and I told them about all my research. Pretty soon, one by one, members of the full committee said, I'll co-sponsor that, I'll co-sponsor that. Mr. Montgomery came down and shook my hand and said, I guess you did it. And, it and at that meeting with the President Obama, in the audience, two gray-haired nice ladies came up to me. One of them was in tears. She hugged me and said, if you hadn't passed that bill, my children and I would have been home. So I told her. Now to the flag. First, everyone stand, please, and follow me in the Pledge of Allegiance. <clears throat> I pledge allegiance to the flag from the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Now, the history of the pledge is this. It came 101 years after the beginning of the United States government. The Constitution and the United States government, George Washington became president on March 4th, 17, 
1892, believe it or not, a socialist minister in Boston wrote the pledge. And he wrote it for a summer youth camp of kids. Wanted to instill patriotism for kids. President Benjamin Harrison loved it, and Congress finally approved it. But it has never been legally binding. And I'll tell you why. And here we need context. We need to figure out who the people were that revolted against Britain in the Revolutionary War. And as you know, there are two names for that George Washington War, the War for Independence and the Revolutionary War. In my opinion, there should be one, revolutionary. It was revolutionary for two reasons. First, it was a bloody revolution. At least 100,000 American colonists got together and began killing English redcoat soldiers because they were dissatisfied. It was a bloody revolution. Make no mistake about it. It was cruel. And they beat them up with the help of France. But even more important than that, oh, the school came. Even more important than that, it was a revolution because it truly changed things. There you go. Thank you. Now, further context. The American Revolution began in England in the 1600s, before or at about the time the colonies were beginning to accept English. It began in the English Civil War. Mainly the Puritans, they were religious. It was a religious war, but it was also an economic, political war. In the 15, 1600s in England, 5% of people owned land. The rest were penniless, landless. So they decided they didn't like that. And the king, Charles I, believed in divine right of kings. And what that means is, the king says, God appointed me. And the important thing about divine right is that the king is always right. So he said to all those people, suck it up. You're not really starving. I'm the great king, shut up. Well, they had a war actually three little wars that lasted about eight years, and the people won, and they killed the king. They chopped his head off. Then they began instituting equality. There was a group in the model army under Cromwell uh, <clears throat> called the Lovelers, and here was their slogan. The poorest he in England should have the same rights as the richest he. Now, even those uh, revolutionary lovelers and egalitarians, you notice they didn't mention the, the poorest she. Then the other, the next great king in English history, 1689. Here's what happened. Remember they killed Charles I. They went on for a while with Parliament, but then they 
you know, this was way back. They said, look, we've got castles, and coaches, and crown jewels, and crowns and stuff, and scepters, and all oh, thrones. Now, to be equal with Europe, we still need a king and queen. Parliament sent messengers to Holland to speak with Prince William and Princess Mary of Holland. And here's what they said. They said, hey, would you two come to England and please be our king and queen? Well, what do you think? Did they accept everybody? Well, yeah, it's tough to turn down. When the new King William got to Parliament, he can only speak German, but they translated, he said this, listen carefully, we accept the gracious gift of the people and Parliament of England. We accept the gracious gift. Now, here's an audience question. Fill in these blanks. In the 1600s, that's the war, that's the glorious revolution, the people of England blanked and blanked their king. Rhymed, the words rhyme, five letters dealing with employment law. Hired and fired. Hired and fired. Now, is that same and true? Yeah. Because, again, who hires and fires people? Four-letter word rhymes with hoss. The boss. Okay. In England, in the 1600s, the people became the boss. Now, at, that, at both those events, there were Englishmen in the colonies. They were... England, they loved England. Uh, Ron and Laura, flag number one, the Grand Union flag. Did you have English during chair again? Is that still called? On the cover it says Grand Union. Okay, Ron's sitting there right now. Do you have another chair? Did you like, uh, do you want me to try to fix that chair for you? Uh, you mean over this one? Yeah. Yeah. Maybe we could do that, because I don't know why it's. Going I on. just moved it. Could you, could you pull up I will fix that microphone so you can sit. Here, oh, no. I'll go back to the chair. I have a handheld. I have no. a handheld microphone. I'll just stand right here. No, I was saying I have a handheld microphone. It's like well, no, we need to get back to the flag. Okay. I got the flag out. We got the flag here. All right, you can see the Grand Union flag. What's, what's where the stars usually are? Cross, yeah. What? Okay, it's called the Union Jack. It's the English flag. This flag flew over George Washington's army until 1776. In the officer's mess, by the way, I've been in an officer's mess, they drink brandy. They would toast the King of England. These, this is the rebel army in America. That's their flag. Do they love England? Everybody. Yes. They spoke English. They used English money. They used English law. They paid English taxes even without representation. They loved England. And what did they learn? from their British cousins. Did they learn anything in the war? Everybody. Who's the boss? <laughs> Did the people win or lose the war? In England. People won the war in England. Yes. And what did they do to the king? Killed him. They killed him. Then, did the people in England, did the boss hire new kings? Yes. So what did the people learn? They learned that a bloody revolution will work. And they learned it from their cousins in England. Now, here's the next flag. Number two, it's called 
the snake. It's yellow, I think. Yeah. <coughs> Hold that up. Yeah. Think of that. Okay, you're obviously the American colonists are the snake. And they're saying to Great Britain, don't even touch us. Don't step on us. Or we'll kill you. Now, by the way, it's a Massachusetts timber, timber rattler. It's not, it's not lethal. But still, look at the message. They learn from their cousins that the way you get what you want is you fight a bloody revolution and kill the king's soldiers. Everybody understand that? Yes. Got it? Yeah. Don't try that. Because okay. That's, the That's who they were. Was that a question? Yes. Was that the next Any play? questions so far? Was that the next play? I lost that. I mean, I. Don't try that. Was that Wait, was the I next play? I remember after, hearing louder. After the, after the, the first play, the Don't Tread on Me was the next play, correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. Am I missing? <laughs> if, it's up to you if you think it's the best. That's great. Huh? No, I didn't say the best. The next. Yeah. The, the that's, next. Yeah, that's why I named them. Yeah. Okay. We have the Canton English. Yellow. Then now, then we have the yellow snake flag. Our third flag will be called Appeal to Heaven. So holders of the flag. It's called. i um, written on there. It's Appeal to Heaven. Can anybody find that? One? Yeah, we've got it up here. We're I, I thought they were pretty clear. I'm sorry. Now, this is another Revolutionary War flag. And here's the key. There was an English philosopher in 1690, after the war, after the Glorious Revolution, who wrote a book called The Second Treatise on Government, as name of John Locke. And he said, in his philosophical way, yes, the people have a right to bloody revolution. And instead of saying, now, don't tread on me like, you know, like the colonists, he was a philosopher, so what he said is, if the king is a tyrant, there's only one thing to do, appeal to heaven, and that was their more official flag. Okay. Now, when Thomas Jefferson wrote the Declaration of Independence, you all know, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, they are adopted other created with certain unalienable rights, God-given rights that our government cannot take away. Later in the Declaration, he wrote, in order to secure these rights, the people have the unquestioned right to alter or abolish the government. What does alter mean? Change. 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 If the king is a tyrant, the people have a right to change the government or even abolish the All right. So they did. And now, any comments or questions on those three flags <clears throat> that literally led to America being free? Of course, by the way, in, you know, July 4th, Declaration of Independence. In Congress, it was the 10th of June, one of the members stood up and said, let's cut to the chase, let's all vote. We need to revolt, we need to fund George Washington's army, we need to cut our ties with England, and they voted. Right after that, George Washington met with Betsy Ross, and you know that flag, 13 stripes, 13 stars in a circle. I didn't bring that. I was too cheap to buy it because you all know it. By the way, <laughs> Tony, 
You all know that play. Yes. yes. Now, any other questions on those American flags? What gave them the authority? Whose authority was it that brought these flags to prominence? Was it the oh, uh, con Congress? Yeah. The Continental Congress? Yeah. Well, George Washington went to Betsy Ross. It's not clear. I think it was probably Washington's idea. She yeah. just sums it up. What could Congress say? <laughs> now, what would they say? George, we want you to fight the English that are far superior to us and lose thousands of soldiers get, and take all those risks, and we don't like your flag. Do you think that can happen? Yeah, the gentleman who asked, is that going to happen? No. What they said it. Thanks a lot, George. Great flag. That's what they said. By the way, they didn't talk like that, but that's probably what they, probably what they meant. Everybody agree? Okay. Later, Congress has hearings and stuff. Now, let me check the time. The time is 7.33 p.m. We have time. I've got one more flag that I really like. And there's a great story. So it's the last one on the folder. It says T E X A X, text. Please hold on. <clears throat> now you see the long. Okay, is that holding up? And it's the Lone Star flag. And what else is, what other artifact is? In the flag. A cannon. Now, does anybody want to know why they've got a cannon in there? I think it's Okay. Here's what happened in Texas before the Civil War. As you know, they first colonized the Atlantic coast and they began moving west. People from New York, New Jersey, Pennsylvania moved into Michigan, Indiana, Ohio, and on up into Minnesota. People in the southern states moved to Texas. I met with an old fellow in Tennessee once who'd been a sheriff, and he had to uh, keep the court records. And he found in the, in the 1800s that any person with a lawsuit or maybe a even a criminal charge, a lot of them, the clerk would just simply write, gone to Texas. So you could either go to trial or go to Texas. Davy Crockett went to Texas. Remember that movie? Anybody? Yeah. Yeah. Now, the trouble with that, and by the way, the later Confederate States of America loved it, they brought their slaves with them. Mexico had been conquered by France. And France, in the 1830s, had become against slavery. So they said to Mexico, <clears throat> no slavery in Mexico, and you've got all those Texans over there. you got to tell them there's no slavery. Well, the Texans, of course, Texans have their own personality. And it's a little bit, instead of a Massachusetts timber rattler, that's not lethal, in Texas they've got real rattlesnakes that can kill you. So they didn't want to use the rattlesnake flag. But they decided to have a revolution. By the way, this is 1830s. <clears throat> 200 years after their English cousins proved that if you don't like the government, you have a bloody revolution. Everybody remember that? Yes. So the Texans began to mobilize. And they soon found out that said, gee, we don't have any cannons. Well, they stole a cannon from the Mexicans. And 
They've been rabble rousing for a while. But the Mexicans, Montezuma, and the French just kept saying, no, nah, you got you can't have slaves anymore. On the other hand, when the Texans stole their cannon, that's when the Mexicans got mad. And that's when they sent the Legion of Santa Ana to the Alamo. And ultimately to San Jacinto, where San Houston defeated them, and Texas became the Lone Star Republic. But that's why the cannon is there. And what does it say? Everybody read out loud. What does it say in those cannon? Come and get it. No. Come and take it. So they made that flag after they stole the cannon. They turned toward Mexico and turned free. Hey, come and take it, baby. All right, any questions further? We will finish on time. Any other questions? No, it's all good. Okay, gang. See you soon. Thanks a lot for coming. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Todd. I do actually have a question, and it's sure. been a few years since I've been in school, and I should probably know this. However, this is Laura, a new chaperone. Or chaper I was chaperoning today at a, at a tea party oh. in, at the barn today, Ellis Barn, so forgive me. I'm um, your host, I guess. So anyhow, um, the question I had, the hostess with the mostess, that's right. <laughs> My question is, um, so each state, I guess, how would each state or who who would who would determine what the flag would be for each state? The members of Congress. The members of Congress. Yeah, here's a question. Okay. The <coughs> the uh, Betsy Ross flag has thirteen stripes and thirteen stars. The the flag that flew at Fort McHenry that they wrote the Star Spangled Banner about came after two more states had joined the Union. So some idiot, and this early on the Congress is an idiot, I think. They had, they put 13 stars, but 15 stripes. It's just, okay. Well then, after that, after the Star Spangled Banner is written in 1818, Congress said, from now on, 13 stars and one strike per state, and they, after a state is admitted, they put in the extra star. Oh yeah, the extra star, strike. 13 strikes, good, thanks. I'm getting bold. So that's who. Any other questions? Good question. I'd like to see a flag with 50 strikes on it. What? I'd like to see a flag with 50 strikes on it. Oh, yeah. Well, the one with 15 is bad enough. Yeah. Any other questions? <clears throat> See, that's... I, think, I got one question. How what's, they, what's your name? Yes. The oh. Confederate flag, Paul Buckus and Dave. Oh. How did they design the check. Confederate flag? Oh, we do have time. Yes. First of all, you all remember the Confederate battle flag. <coughs> Red. Stars now, oh, yes. when I was in OCS and I was doing map reading, on a map, when you have a rectangle with an X, it means a unit of infantry. The battle flag was developed by Stonewall Jackson, who had been a West Point graduate, and he, of course, knew the value of the infantry. And that was the battle flag, red, with the X, and the, third, the 11 star. The original flag that they had after secession was a very stupid flag. It had in the corner seven stars, because by then only seven states had seceded. And then it had um, not exactly seven stripes, depending. It was very strange. That's why no one's up. I didn't even know about it until I researched it, because everybody knows it's the rebel flag. Yeah. Any, any other question? No. Okay, we get out early. Karen, this, this, this is her 
just for the amusement thing. Why was uh, Santa Ana allowed to live after the bloody battle of, uh, when he, in the battle of Texas? Why was he allowed to live? He just got away. No. I know that. I, don't, I don't think they are. I think I know. I don't think they arrested him. I think he went back to Mexico and opened but a coffee shop. If they allowed him, if they allowed, if the they told him, they would have no one to sign the surrender. That's the only reason Santa Ana well, okay. was allowed to go back to Mexico. Well, they could sell Robert E. Lee in Houston. That's just what I thought about. Well, okay. <laughs> I would say it was a formality. It was. But, uh, but the, the uh, U.S. government says, yeah, if we well, kill him, who will sign this? Uh, we hope that the Russian generals won't survive after their yeah. lives. Okay, any and final? Part of the negotiations for Santa Ana was that he was going to sign yeah, surrender over to yeah. the United States. That's why he left. But that's the only reason they let him live. Instead of killing him like they, they were the king, they wanted the land. Yeah. And so he, yeah. he pulled quite a deal. I thought Texas was the only public until they were admitted as the state. I okay. thought they were a separate, separate entity. Well, you know, the Texans do what they want. All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. Thank, Thank you, you Laura. You are delightful. Oh, one more question. Sure. Wow. Um, I just wanted to thank you for lobbying for the veterans. Yes. Oh. Um, I am a, a veteran's widow, so oh, I, I have received the oh. benefits, and it's because of you, so thank you. Well, well, thank thank you. you. Well, it was a challenge. As soon as they told me no one had ever done it before. Okay, and one more question. Sure. Your, your name is Todd, and in relation to Mary Todd Lincoln, no, no, not really. Okay. I always like what Lincoln said. He said the 1D was good enough for God, but the Todd's needed too.